and I want to talk about what it means to trust God. What it means to trust God. We're, we're opening up a new series called Truly Sanctified, but you can't be, san- sanctification, what that means is a process of becoming more Christ-like. It's a process of becoming more, what it means to live in Christ, what it means to live the way you and I were actually created to live. And, but it starts with a trust exchange. It really is a trust exchange. All the way from the beginning of the Bible right through to the end of Scripture, we see people fighting for control. And God's just good. God's secure. He knows He's in control. And uh, that's what I'm going to be preaching on today. And that is a tension that you and I live in in our every moment of every day of our life is will you take control or will you give up control to the Lordship of Christ? Amen. Amen. So I've had many moments in, in, in our life where I felt out of control. And that is, that is really key times. When, you, when your life feels out of control, you hesitate to trust. In a circumstance that feels like it's spinning out of control. And typically all of life's problems fit in three categories. Either health some sort of diagnosis, some sort of tragedy. Even I got a stomach virus like four weeks ago and it was like the worst sickness I've had in the long, I felt out of control. I mean, I'm just vomiting everywhere and you're just like, man, and you want to do anything you possibly can. Um, You know, in those moments, you just, when life feels, so it's either health, it's either relational or it's either financial. You can pretty much factor, I would say the most stress that anyone has is when relationships go out of control. That is a very problematic thing for any marriage, any parent. Relationships are the thing that are most dear to our heart and sometimes we don't take, sometimes we take it for granted until it actually starts going down the toilet. And, uh, and so, but the same with health and the same with finances and, and that's very real in today's world. And this story of 12 Pauline Avenue, this building, and our journey as a church for 10 years, or actually 11, we moved, we moved here to Ontario on the 20th of August in 2012, and we started with six other people, Jess and I, Pastor Greg and Vanessa in Hamilton with two of those people, faithful, faithful, faithful. And we, uh, we flew over from Calgary, the four of us, two couples, and we bought two houses in 24 hours, just trusting God. We didn't even know what we were buying. We just told the realtor, this is our budget. The realtor laughed at us. And then he said, well, this is your neighborhood. And he gave us like six houses to choose from. That's all you get. And so we did. We signed two deals, trusting God. And we were, we were burning the bridge and raising the flag as a church. There was no turning back. There was no plan B. And to have that mentality as a Christ follower, to have that mentality as someone that says, I don't want just Jesus because, you know, it's popular right now or because my friends are choosing Jesus, but I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what the trial, no matter what the test. And last week at conference, at our Canada conference that we had, there was altar calls and there was a lot of people putting their hand up to follow the call of God in their life. And Matthew chapter 16 is a chapter where God is inviting people to deny themselves, to take up the cross and be disciples of Jesus. And his presentation of that is very problematic because it requires us to let go of control. And so doing set up and, ten, uh, set up and tear down for 10 years in, in venues, it's been, honestly, it's been a privilege to, to do this. But in the first year of our church, kind of felt like it was spinning out of control. We were in 13 different venues. I have a photo of our very first uh, church service meeting that was at Emmanuel College on the Uni- Uni- University of Toronto campus. And we're trying to like shoehorn church into, you know, what are the different requirements that you need as a church. We're, and we did this in Hamilton when we were looking for venues in Hamilton. But we're looking for a good location, a good price, weekly availability, style and functionality, seating capacity, favorable managers, hopefully storage and reliability. And you're trying to factor all these, you're trying to basically align the stars to find a place to rent in the city of Toronto, it wasn't easy, 13 different venues. We got to this point uh, where we were setting up, and I got a photo here of some of the setup at St. Luke's. We literally used to fly a truss and have speakers hanging on it in like an elementary school gymnasium. I've got a time-lapse video that you can play, and you can actually see 
how the church used to set up. And it was so beautiful because uh, it was this transformation process of a venue that literally was a metaphor of how God was transforming lives. To take something like a basketball court and actually turn it into the house of God. And we did this for years and some of you are like holding your breath thinking, man, that's crazy. I mean, sometimes it is crazy to follow God. And to, and to, but it, it felt like a privilege. That's where the muscle team was birthed. Shout out to all the muscle team members. Come on. And even at Hamilton, man, you got to be thankful for the storage on site and for the venue that we have and certain things are like, you got to be thankful as we, as we do this thing and follow the will of God. And we got a, um, we've got a before and after photo of what you can see in that particular space and it looks night and day difference. And I like that because it's kind of like your life and my life. There's a before... F- before photo of you before Christ. There's a BC and an AD for your life. There's a before Christ moment. There's a dividing line where he comes in and he revives your heart and he renews your soul, changes your life forever if you trust him. And you're going to have that invitation today to trust Jesus. So we were kicked out of many venues for many reasons. Either we were too loud, change of plans, they had renovations, availability, or COVID. We had 86 Sundays consecutively as a church where we weren't able to meet because we were in rented venues. And if we had a venue like this during COVID, I mean, that timeline could have been cut in half. And I felt like I, as a leader sometimes and trying to, trying to guide the church to its future and, you know, you're trying to make good decisions, you feel out of control many times. And the constant temptation to take control. And we're always seeking God. Is this venue our home? Is this is this the right vibe? And that's what we were doing in Hamilton when I mean, Pastor Greg and Vanessa, we had our own little venue journey in Hamilton, but we're believing and seeking God that as we see what we have at City Kids there, but there is a future venue in Hamilton, amen. You better believe it. You better lean in that as we trust God and God lets us and allows us to go through certain processes in order that we would depend on Him. It's because of the pride of humanity. You and I are so prideful. We're so full of ourselves. And that what we do is we actually make gods out of ourselves. And that what God sometimes will do is God is patient. And he knows that he can get you out of any tomb. That's the problem with God is he actually, there is no such thing as death when it comes to him. So what he'll do is if there is pride in our heart, he'll actually pull back and just be patient. Like Pastor Phil preached at conference in the story of Lazarus from John chapter 11, Jesus stayed where he was three more days. And that could be some circumstance in your life. Why isn't God moving? Can't he see that my life's out of control? Yeah, he can see that your life is out of control. But what he can see even more than that is your neglect to depend on him. So he's waiting back. He's just waiting for you to get to a point to actually surrender. Whose heart will totally turn and seek the Lord? He's scanning the whole world, Chronicles says, to seek those who are fully devoted to Him. Not half-hearted, not lukewarm. Christians and Christ followers and sanctified saints that will actually say, I need you, Christ. And it's not because I'm saying it with my mouth just because the economy is going bad, but my heart is actually far from God. God can bypass the words that are coming out of your mouth and actually read your heart. And he's waiting. So is that relationship going to stay in your control? How's that going for you? Is that situation, that mental health situation, how's that going for you just dealing with it by yourself? Like the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years eventually said, I've got to get through this crowd and I, I don't care who sees me. I don't care. I'm going to be more undignified. And God is looking at the church in Toronto and in Hamilton and across Canada. And he's waiting for some desperate people to actually get a reality check of life and weave their way through other people and reach out to God. Truly. And this is happening in our church right now. People are reaching out to God. People are crying out to Jesus, abandoning and repenting of the pride of humanity and actually saying, I need God. But it's a tension. Somebody say tension. Okay, so we're seeking God, trying to find our home. And even at the Art Gallery of Ontario was one of the venues that we found and had plush seats and a you know, nice stage and storage room off the side. 
And uh, it was a beautiful venue, and at, that was in, in the first year of our church as well. And, uh, and God just, there was too much human reasoning and human strength there. And what happened is, is just like what happened before we came into Pauline, there was a disruption, and, and, and it, all of a sudden the contract fell through, and, and it became not our place. And that's when God took us to that basketball court, and I wasn't prepared for it. Our team weren't prepared for it to actually, like, you know, people used to bring two changes of clothes to church because they would sweat. That's where Pastor Jerry started leading one of them. And Pastor Jerry is one of the greatest disciple makers that we have in our church. And this is the principle of doing teams and everything like that is we don't use people to build the church. We use the church to build people. And as team members over the time have, have submitted to Pastor Jerry and Katie and said, you know what, I know this is good for me and I'm a, there's a process there of sanctification and discipleship. And there have been people that have leaned into that and there have been people that have resisted it. And it's okay. It's all good. God is good. Amen. But even through the setup and teardown, this was the greatest growth and revival as a church. And I got a photo of a one Easter Sunday where we packed out that gymnasium uh, and it was, and, and that's when revival kicked off and growth. And we shouldn't, you'd never resent the trials that you face. James says we'll face trials of many kind. What is the trial that you're in right now? Don't resent it. We shouldn't always pray that we would get out of the trial. We should pray of what we will get out of the trial. Who said that? Someone preached that. I'm stealing that. Someone, was that Pastor Phil? I love it when Pastor Phil preaches just before I do because I just got all these maxims like in the back of my head and eventually I'll claim them to be my own. So we're renting schools and we're in Central Tech for a while and that was a great long stretch of a season as a church and we were blessed to be at the Toronto School Board um, and, and renting from the, the buildings there and as I said, in, in COVID, and in the middle of COVID, through those 86 Sundays that we were online and we weren't able to meet, God still proved to be faithful. Because in 2021, that is when our church purchased 330 Geary Avenue, a $13.8 million building, and talk about feeling like, man, this is a trust exchange. But God led us. And if you can trust Him, man, He will blow your stinking mind. Am I allowed to say that? He will blow you away. Sometimes many reasons that we don't trust God is because in actual fact, walking on water is super scary to us. But I want to tell you after a season of walking on water and you actually see God's right hand deliver you over and over and over again, walking on water eventually gets more comfortable than living in the boat. I think the most nervous thing that I face as a leader now is when I'm in the place of safety. When I'm in the place of control, I get nervous and I'm like, God, I gotta, I got, I'm not in a place where I need you and that's a problem. And so the grace lifted eventually and life went out, out of control. Grace lifted from the TDSB. And God warned me in May, he, oh, just after Easter, he said, Sam, your church is going to go through a season of immense spiritual warfare, but at the end of it, it's going to be a miracle. And we've had different people, you know, you know you're, you're a church that are doing great things in Canada. And I'm not saying that egotistically. I'm just saying that it's obvious that there is great, amazing life changes going on in this church. And that's not because of Jess and I. That's because of the faithfulness and the community that it surrounds us and our faith in God. And so, you know, we've, we, over the summer, we've, under, we've gone through some things. And, uh, and one of those things is like a, an, an immediate notice like, the, we, we're not going to do a Christian church here anymore like you, and you need to get out. And, uh, and it was disruptive, and we were scrambling and trying to go into different schools, and we had, like, uh, a Catholic school that we were at. But for some reason, and th when things shift like that, when the grace moves, and Pastor Katie got a word from God, and it's good to have praying godly people around your life because you aren't meant to do this thing alone. And Pastor Katie got a word and she didn't really know what it meant at the time, but the word was, I am moving you from the Lord. I am moving you. And you know, sometimes where you are right now is God is shifting something. And if you feel that, you've got to trust Him for the next move. And so the grace and the things that we prayed for in the past now had changed. And, and that's like the tabernacle in the Old Testament is it used to lift and move 
Don't move if God's not moving. But if God's moving, get your butt and move. And so it's seeking God and discerning God and trusting God along the way. So we're scrambling, we're looking at other venues, and we're getting prices from different places that were like $10,000 plus a Sunday. And there just wasn't any options because Geary Avenue, that's getting rezoned, and that's a long process, and we're undergoing renovations there. And being in Geary Avenue as our permanent home might be, you know, a, a, a three to five year journey even from now. It's a patient journey and we're walking that out and God's doing it and, we're, but, and now we've got this like stepping stone right here. And on Father's Day, which was in the middle of June, June 18th, it, we, we were solutionless and I got up in front of the church and had to say, church, we don't have any options. And just to be honest, I don't know where we're going to meet next week. And so on Monday, June 19th, collapsed before God in my morning devotions and just said, I've done this before. There's been moments like this before. And you might have had these moments. And you might relate. Collapsed before God and said, God, I need you. There's got to be a way. I don't, I don't know how this is going to work out. And at 4.22 p.m., the same day on June 19th, I get a voice note on my phone from a friend that said, hey, this is super random, man. But I got a friend of mine who is a developer and he's putting this property that he bought, a church property, an old Catholic church in downtown Toronto. And I'm telling you the story to build your faith. I'm telling you the story so that you can relate it to your life. And, and the Bible in the Old Testament, they used to recount the story of the Red Sea and recount the story of times. And they used to write it around their lives so that they would remember God's faithfulness. Because God's calling you and I to trust Him. And at 4.22 p.m., the voice note said, so this developer, maybe you want to reach out to him. I don't know if you even need something. And this guy had no idea what we were going through. I call the developer on the spot. I get the phone number, call the guy. I say, hey, I'm interested in the building. Can I see you tomorrow? And he's like, oh, yeah, like, okay. Like, I'll meet you there. How about 1 p.m.? Done. <laughs> Bang. Meet him 1 p.m., Seven days later, we had keys in our hand and a contract, a lease contract on this property. We had to trust. And so we got full-time availability here. This is a flexible space that we've never had before. We can do men's and women's stuff out of here. We're going to relaunch all in our team service on... On, on October 4th is when we're gonna do that. And Hamilton, I wanna speak directly. The culture of Hamilton, there is revival on the horizon. And it's gonna require each and every one of you, and I'm talking to each and every one of you, it's gonna require us to surrender and lean in on a whole new level. And I know the drive to Toronto is a little bit of a drive, but there are some small barriers to us seeing revival. And Greg and Vanessa do it all the time, so like you can just go talk to them. But I want you to lean in, church, because all in is going to be an invitation for Hamilton as well. You, we are one church. And all in is where the most condensed culture of who we are and who we're becoming, and it's a call to action. And Hamilton team, you need to commit once a month to coming all in. Amen. Amen. Because we're, we're taking on revival. So we can do all the things that we need to do out of here. And I just want to shout out, I got another video of the renovation that took place here in six weeks. We kept it kind of quiet because, uh, because of all what the hate was going on. And I, I just, sometimes you've got to be sneaky and, 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 and make sure that you're shrewd as a snake. And you don't need to do the sound. And innocent as a dove, it's this cool little dance video. And it, it would make me start dancing or doing something weird. Now the church want to do the sound. Um... But uh, seeing the transformation take place here again, and I just, I got to shout out a few people. Josh, Ray. Josh, Ray. And like, he was crawling through the ceiling with like electrical cables and basically rewired. He's an electrician by trade, but he was, so you're safe. Um, Amanda. Jeff, all the staff, come on, Ryan, 
Ryan put in so many hours. Rachel and Scott, I know you're here somewhere, put in so many hours. Bri Brian Maha built this stage, built the sound box. Our Hamilton crew, Chris from Hamilton, uh, drove, we bought these pews off Facebook Marketplace for 1500 bucks. Pretty cool, eh? And, um, but he went with his truck uh, from, and came and picked up all the pews and was bringing them in here. And my Mazzucato and a whole bunch of people from Hamilton, shout out. Man, we are one church. We are one church. Amen. So that's the story. I honestly felt out of control. And just like Pastor Katie said with the roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland, is when, when you're on a device, like those roller coasters are all super safe. Talk about safety protocol that they have in Canada. I was there only just a week earlier and being on that friggin' Yukon striker, like that is death. That. But, but we always want to grip, don't we? And sometimes life can feel like the Yukon striker. It can feel like a roller coaster out of control. But the truth is, is you ain't going nowhere. You're good and God's got you if you trust Him. And sometimes it's hard to just enjoy the ride because it face trials with joy. What a weird statement, James. You must be crazy. But God's inviting you to trust Him. All right, so I've got, a, I got 18 minutes to, to preach on. But I want to read you this scripture from Matthew chapter 16, because this just shows the signs of humanity. Matthew chapter 16 says, The Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him, this is verse 1, to show them a sign from heaven. And so they were testing him and they were asking him for a sign. And you and I do this all the time. And Jesus is like, man, you can read the weather, but you can't actually see what's right in front of you. And God's saying, man, you're smart people. And there was a miracle that just happened. Jesus had literally just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves and a bunch of fish, done this amazing miracle, and they were still asking for the elimination of doubt. Show me a sign. Jesus, I will follow you. I will step up to any altar call and cry out to God. I will obey you. I will start giving in obedience to you. As long as you eliminate all doubt for me. Is that not like you and I? Is that not like our lives? Is this safe? Can you show me a sign? And Jesus, and his response, he says in verse 4, But none will be given to you except the sign of Jonah. Then Jesus left and went away. <laughs> He's like, you've got what you need already. Point one is we already have the signs. We just need to see them. We need to open our eyes and see Christ. I don't know where, where you're hesitating on trusting God. And you might not feel ready to trust God. We likely hardly ever feel ready to trust God. But you and I already, what is the sign of Jonah? The story of Jonah is Jonah went into a fish for three days, he went into a dark place and he came out and he was called to be the savior of Nineveh. And the sign of Jonah is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus went down into the tomb and the belly of the fish represents the tomb for three days and he came out resurrected. Because of who Jesus is, the Messiah, because of who Jesus is, we have all that we need to trust God. When you and I invite Jesus into our life, we have everything that we need. And so what happens in Matthew chapter 16 is Jesus warns them in the next few verses to not follow along with the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were trying to maintain control, who were trying to control, they were religious, trying to control outcomes. And then Peter, there's this story with Peter from verse 13 and I don't think the screens have this, but it says, Jesus asked Peter, who do people say that the Son of Man is? What do you see? Do you see Christ? Because your ability, your and my ability to trust God, 
to trust God in our romantic relationships, to trust God when life is spinning out of control, to trust God financially and actually surrender to Him in that way, to trust God in our health and actually believe for miracles, signs and wonders. Our ability to trust God, our level of faith in God is directly proportionate to our level of, rela- uh, of revelation of who Jesus is. That's why as a church, we exist to connect you to God. And I'm telling you, Hamilton, if you can open your eyes and see Christ, don't just listen to the preaching. Have some sort of faith where you say, God, awaken me. I want to see you. And Peter said, this is who the Son of Man is. Because some say he's a prophet. Some say, and if you just believe that God's a prophet, you'll only be able to trust him at a certain level. Some say this about Jesus. Some say that about Jesus. I'm not speaking to your friend. I'm not speaking to your spouse. I'm not speaking to anyone around you. I'm not speaking to your kids. And I'm not speaking to your parents. I am speaking to you. Who do you say that Jesus is? Well, I don't know if I have much of a relationship. I was just dragged along to church. My wife is the one that's the faith person. Well, I'm telling you, God created you nonetheless. Who do you say that Jesus, I don't say much about Jesus right now. Well, that's why you struggle in life. That's why you struggle to trust him. And when your eyes get open and Jesus comes and floods into your life like a light, then all of a sudden the veil is lifted and you see God. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, for I'm going to build your life on this rock, the revelation of Jesus. And I encourage you, church, The revelation of who Jesus is, is the rock that your feet can stand on. There is nothing more secure than knowing Christ. And you're like, well, I thought what you're inviting me to is a scary life, a one outside the boat, walking on water, a one of revival, a one of craziness, a one of, that's exactly, I'm I'm inviting you to the roller coaster ride. Jesus is inviting you to the roller coaster ride, but you will not be able to follow Jesus and be truly sanctified in Him if you do not know Him as your chief cornerstone. But here's the thing number two, the temptation for us is to take control. And that's what that roller coaster is. The temptation for you and I is to always grip. I mean, there is nothing you can do. That, that, that harness is down. And honestly, the Yukon roller coaster was like a really comfortable seat. Like when you, when you sit in it and it comes down, it's like, ooh, this is like made for my body. <laughs> it's not until the thing starts moving forward that we start freaking out. And you want to grip. So, you know, you get to a comfortable financial situation. But then things start to move out of control. And what do you do? You want to grip. You feel okay, relationships are good, you're comfortable. But then what do you do? Someone actually betrays you. You're offended and you know that you need to forgive. Well, what do I do here? I can't control my spouse. Why are they acting this way? I can't control my boyfriend, my girlfriend. I don't know what, and what do we want to do? Man, when we don't feel the way we should be feeling, what do we want to do? We want to grip. And the invitation in those moments the temptation, the temptation is to not take control, it's actually to give control to God. There's two ways in the Garden of Eden to trust God and to let go of control or to take control and take matters in your own hands, the two trees. Genesis 3 verse 6 says this, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good and pleasing to the eye, the temptation to do things according to the way of our world, the way of Canada, and was also desirable for gaining wisdom, what did she do? She took for herself. She took for herself. This is the temptation that you and I face in every single decision we face in life. In verse 22, well, let me read from verse 21. So what happens is Peter gets this great revelation, and then Jesus starts to explain to the disciples all the bad things that are going to happen, because like if we do things the Jesus' way. So he says in verse 21, from, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that was his destiny, that was where the cross happened, and suffer many things. God doesn't promise, promise you a life without suffering. If you read the New Testament, he likely promises you a life with suffering as a Christian. 
at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, all the crazy people in Toronto that hate churches. (laughs) You didn't even know if you could laugh then. (laughs) When you follow God, you're going to be misunderstood. When you step out in God, some friends are going to turn against you and think you're crazy. When you say yes to God, some of your family members are going to misunderstand you and they might act in certain ways that you never thought that they could react. What if you respect everybody else, but they don't respect you for your decision in Jesus? What happens then? What happens then if you tolerate everybody else around your life, but the people that claim about tolerance don't actually tolerate you? What do you do then? Interesting questions. Killed on the third day, but be raised to life. He's given, and that's the promise. What did Peter do in verse 22? Peter took. The temptation always is to take matters into your own hands. So what did Peter do? What was his response? What was his knee-jerk reaction? Hey, I see you, Jesus. This is going to be great. Let's go. Let's ride this thing, baby. I got, I got the Messiah revelation. Jesus is like, that is great. Then all of a sudden, because Peter is a human being just like you and I, He gets the message and the notification that life could spin out of control. What did he do? I took Jesus aside. He takes matters in, he takes control. And he says, Jesus, this is not going to happen. And then Jesus responds in a crazy way. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And Satan wants to be a stumbling block to you in Hamilton. He wants to be a stumbling block to your obedience in God when you start to walk out the things in God and all of a sudden you have to trust God because everything is not in your control and then you start to take back control. You need to speak to the enemy who's trying to steal, kill and destroy from you li- from your life and you need to say, hey, 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 memo, get behind me, Satan. You're not going to tempt me to take matters into my own hands. I am going to follow Jesus with all the faith that I have. I'm going to surrender to God and I'm going to finally give my trust over to Him. It's not easy. And I'm talking like this because there was a lot of people last week responding to the call of God. Saying, I'll follow you God. I'm good. And I'm giving you the plan B. I'm giving you the part B message. That it's going to require many times for us to resist temptation and take matters in our own hands and say, Satan, do not tempt me to do it in my own human strength. Stop it, shut up, and get behind me. I'm telling you, your relationships will be so good if you don't do them in your strength and you do them and trust God. Your marriage will be so good if you don't try and work it out in your own strength and you trust God. Surrender, laying down your life. Your finances will be pressed down, shaking together and running over if you don't do it in your own strength and you trust God. The fear in your life will be gone if you don't try and manage it in your own strength, but you trust God. The mental health issues that you go through will be managed and dealt with and redeemed and, for, and, and, and miracles will happen if you stop trying to do it in your own strength and you actually listen to the Messiah. You see Christ and you actually can walk forward and God is the way. He is the truth and He is the life and He will provide a way. Stop listening to the enemy and stop taking life in your own hands. It's time to surrender to, con- to control and trust Jesus. I'm preaching passionately and I'm screaming a little bit because I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling at every demon around your life that would try and derail the call of God on your life. I talked about being calculated at conference and now we're done with the days of being calculated. Amen. Last point, miracles happen when we trust God. We can't take matters in our own hands, and I'm going to get the keys up. And I just want to paint this picture, and then I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Greg in Hamilton. And I want you to really look at this picture, because in verse 27, it says this, For the Son of Man, he, Jesus then talks to them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross and follow me, deny themselves. What good is it? Let me read this, verse 26. What good Will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in my Father's glory. This is like the second coming with his angels. 
And then he will, he will reward each person according to what they have done. When you first read that verse, you're like, what's he talking about? He's going to reward me for the decisions that I've made. He's going to reward, there's going to be a reward for, for how I choose to live this life. Now, if you read it in context and you know the whole passage is Jesus inviting them to trust him. You know that what we're rewarded for is our dependence on God. That's what we, I'm not talking about, you know, you got to pray a certain amount of hours a day. You got to read, you got to memorize a bunch of scripture every day. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about in the context here is you and I, and it means to get repaid. It's not like, you know, you're going to get gems in heaven or something like that. It means you will be repaid for a life because you trust and depend on God. If you don't trust and depend on God, you will also be repaid for that life. And Jeremiah gives us an illustration of a cursed life versus a blessed life. And the cursed life is like this picture of a desert. It says this, this is what the Lord says. This is Jeremiah 17, verse five. This is what the Lord said. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person is like a bush in the wasteland. It's like a shrub in the desert, another version says. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives, where there is no life. And you're like, I don't know, Sam, like I've been doing things in my own strength up until now and it's not too bad. That's the trick, isn't it? Because in the end, the wages of sin is death. And what this shrub represents is it represents weakness, it represents stressed, isolated, vulnerable, and dry. That is not the picture of life that God has for you. But there's another picture, because if you keep reading Jeremiah, it gives us the other side. Verse 7: But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. So there's trust in man, or there's trust in the Lord. And we got another image of a different kind of tree whose confidence is in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots out by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worry in the year of drought. It never fails to bear fruit. So if you look at this other image of this other tree, to me, it's like it's a strong, calm, unfazed, secure tree. That's what the Bible means by prosperity. See, the first one, the shrub doesn't recognize when prosperity comes. The tree is living in it. To live a prosperous life is to live a blessed life. I'm not saying that in correlation to money. I'm saying that in correlation to your soul. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet live like a shrub in the desert, or end up like a shrub in the desert for eternity. Or those who trust in the Lord will be like trees planted. What a great picture. Pastor Greg, you can take it over from here. Thank you, Hamilton. God bless you guys. Listen, uh, you can clap if you want. So this is an invitation. It's an invitation to trust God. It's an invitation to not just say that you trust God with your mouth. It's an invitation to surrender your life. And what does this mean? Well, it's a journey, isn't it? It's a journey of leaning in, praying, seeking Him, the revelation of Jesus. To pursue Jesus is to be like the tree planted by rivers of living water. And you're like, Sam, I haven't considered this. Thanks for preaching this today because my life isn't 
the way that I believe it should be. I actually feel like there are areas that are out of control. I actually feel like I've been doing life in my own strength. And it's time, if, if we can have enough faith and enough sense as to who we are as Christians before God, and even in this building story, through, through that chasm of chaos, there was a security there, wasn't there? We knew that we were planted. And we knew, and it was just, man, we're like the crazier things got, the more we knew the miracle was going to be. And so you're like, even though I'm crying out to God and in your faith, you shouldn't be passive. You got to like pull on God. The woman with the issue of blood, man, she crawled through that crowd. Like she wasn't sitting around waiting for Jesus to come to her. But you're not doing it because you're stressed. You're not doing it because your life is out of control. You're doing it because you know where your source is. You know who is the way, who is the truth, and who is the life. And there are too many people that live in Toronto that say, oh, you know, I know Jesus and I'm a Christian, but live their life in complete human strength. And then when life doesn't work out well, they blame God. And the truth is, is that your heart is not surrendered. You've just gotten so used to the habit of doing things your way. And now is the day. And now is the time for God's people to say, I am done living the life that you created me to be by me taking matters in my own hands. I am done trying to grip control. I am done trying to work it out in human reasoning. And I am going to fear God and lean into God and do it in surrender and trust to Him. So I don't care if I'm speaking to one person that's gonna respond today. Hopefully the whole room will respond and say, yes, I'm going to trust God. I'm done. I'm done lying to myself. I'm done trying to take control. And I'm actually going to follow Jesus. It might not be popular. That's what Jesus said. It's going to be denying himself. It's going to be like taking up a cross. It might not be popular. It's not. Trusting God Surrendering your life into His hands, man, it's the most unpopular thing in the Western world right now. Living by the truth of Scripture, having a higher truth, not your truth, my truth, and whatever your truth wants to be, but we have an objective truth, and I trust it. That's not popular. But this is how you and I were created to be. All the way from the Garden of Eden, life is found when we let go of control and we trust God. Amen.